it's not a sign of intellectual greatness to exclude Marxism. It's not a sign of confidence, and it's not smart. It is, to be blunt, stupid, because you do need to know at least a little bit how other people think differently from you, especially if they have nuclear weapons. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with Pins the Podcat, who is doing some self-cleaning, and then the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 127. And this episode is with the notorious, in a very good way, Richard Wolf, who, whether you agree with him or not, is so fun to speak with and listen to and read, I can say, all three of these things from experience. But Richard is a Marxist economist and professor emeritus of economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and he is also a visiting professor at the New School. This episode, I think, is quite, quite straightforward. And though there are some diversions here and there uh, to Freud and some other issues, we start with why mainstream economists dismiss Marx, and then we move right on to the basics of economics, and then the macroeconomic and social problems that Richard argues plague capitalism and our world because of the same. And in the same spirit as the beginning of our conversation, even if you think socialism is the craziest thing in the world, you should still take this seriously because as we start off with, it's never a bad idea to understand how people think, especially if they have nuclear weapons, even though, to my knowledge, Richard does not have any. There are links in the description to Richard's website because he's up to all sorts of things, and then his weekly show, Economic Update, and then a recent collection of essays that I read called The Sickness is the System. Now, as you know, I love uh, likes, comments, subscribes. So does Pins the Podcast. Uh, they're endlessly appreciated. So if you are able to do any of those things, that'd be great. And now, without any Further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Richard. You write in The Sickness is the System that you were educated at Harvard, Stanford, and Yale, and that not once in all that time studying economics did a professor have you read Marx and his critique of capitalism. And when I read this, I thought, I mean, this is totally ridiculous because even if you're an ardent capitalist, you've got to be able to defend your theory against objections or at least understand its merits relative to alternatives. And I'm not a trained economist or well-versed in the field's culture. So what I was wondering is how it happened that Marx was relegated to philosophy or English departments and ignored by the economists. Uh, I think the answer to that is really quite simple. Um, in my time as a university student, and I can extend it basically to the present because I went from being a student to being a professor of economics, uh, and that's what I've done most of my life. The answer to the question is the Cold War. Uh, in 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 the Second World War, 19, roughly 1941 to 1945, the United States was officially allied with the Soviet Union. Being a Marxist at that time uh, was considered to be a badge of your loyalty. It was understood that the German Nazi regime, Hitler and all of that, had hunted down and murdered huge numbers of communists, socialists, Marxists. So nothing could be more reliable as an opponent of fascism, which the United States was fighting in Germany, Italy, and Japan, than Marxists. And, you know, if we had time, I'd give you the name of 100 Marxists that, that were active in the United States that went to work at the highest levels of the United States government because they were trusted. They became important uh, people doing work for the war effort. At the end of the war, 1945, 
there was a dramatic about face. With the fascist enemy gone, the Germans were defeated, the Italians were defeated, the Japanese were defeated, the American business community decided they were not at all happy with an alliance with the Soviet Union and with the fact that Marxist, socialist, communists were actively doing their things all over the United States because they were trusted allies. And so we had a purge. There's, there's no other way to put it. Uh, sometimes it's called the Cold War. Sometimes it's called McCarthyism. Now, that was the name of a senator from Wisconsin who hunted down socialists, Marxists, communists, wherever they were, in the university, in the labor movement, in government, and brought them up in the glare of publicity, had them say that they were socialists or trapped them in questions and got them fired. I mean, you know, it's happened in other countries. It happened there. So all of this happened particularly in the second half of the 1940s, right after the war, and into the 1950s. What it did, particularly, was to purge colleges and universities. Marxists, leftists were thrown out of their jobs, either because they didn't have tenure, or many of them who had tenure simply had the university ignore the tenure and fire them. Uh, so, for example, when I got to Harvard College, uh, I looked around because I was interested for Marxists. I wanted to see, who, could I find a Marxist professor at Harvard in anything? I, I didn't care what the subject matter was. And I very quickly discovered as a naive freshman that either there weren't any or if they were there, they were scared to be known to be such. It turned out some years later, as I got to be active at Harvard and know people, that I found there were a handful of them, but they were eager not to be so identified. You might be interested to know that one of the people I found was a professor of mathematics, as it happened, not at Harvard, but next door at MIT. Uh, both MIT and Harvard are located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They're short distance from each other, one or two stops on the, on the subway. Um, so I got to work with a man named Dirk Struick, a, well -pub a widely published tenured professor. I, I heard about Noam Chomsky in the language department and so on. Um, and I got to know some of them. I had I met Herbert Marcuse, who was teaching at Brandeis. But there were a handful like that. If you found your way into that circle, which I did, you would you, you had some interaction. Most young people like me, and there were plenty of them, who were interested in the left intellectually, never found their way into those circles. Um, I did. That's a story about my parents, who are Europeans. English is my third language. I grew up speaking French and German. It, it's a different story. But, and it was for those reasons that I had entree into those circles. Marcuse was a German. Uh, Struik was a Scandinavian, and so on. Um, but the truth of it is, my professors were scared. I would raise my hand at Harvard. But the same thing happened at Stanford, and then the same thing happened at Yale. I spent 10 years of uninterrupted schooling at Harvard, Stanford, and Yale. I'm a poster boy for elite education in this country, and all I can tell you is you can fit into a very small room the number of professors I found who knew about Marx, who were comfortable and secure enough to teach about Marx or to answer students' questions. Here's the thing, the experience that happened to me most often. I'd raise my hand. 
I'd ask a question, and the question had something would coming either into Marxism or into socialism or into worker revolutions, stuff like that. And I could see in the professor's face the the, the silent pleading, don't go there. And this is teachers who I liked and teachers who I didn't like. So it really had nothing to do with that. But they would say, oh, I'm not so sure. Oh, that's not an area of my interest. But their eyes were saying, could you please go somewhere else with this question? Or if you have to stay with it, could you come to my office hours and we can talk? You know, I'm not I'm not stupid. I could see I, I had no interest in embarrassing these professors or making their life hard. That was not my interest. So I would stop and, you know, I would I would accommodate the discomfort that was written on their faces so any child could have seen it. Long story short, together with other young students like myself, I went and found teachers outside of those three institutions, or the students together, we had little study groups, and we would read the relevant literature and discuss it. That's how I learned uh, Marxism. I didn't learn it from these institutions, I learned it despite these institutions. And in, in, in one part of your question, I would like to add, it, it's not a sign of intellectual greatness to exclude Marxism. It's not a sign of confidence, and it's not smart. It is, to be blunt, stupid, because you do need to know at least a little bit how other people think differently from you, especially if they have nuclear weapons. And it is kind of dumb. And it's a dumbness that is hurting this country and has throughout my life. The befuddlement of American um, leaders, for example, dealing with Xi Jinping and other leaders in China today, that befuddlement is not because the Chinese people are hard to read. No, and nothing. They may be. I don't know. I don't deal with Chinese people very much, but I seriously doubt that they are anything other than just like you and me. The rest is a stereotype. But here's what I know. The American leaders dealing with them have no clue about the mental formation of people raised in a Marxist tradition of literature. And I'll give you one concrete example. My classmate at Yale, which is where I got my PhD in economics, one of my classmates sitting in the same room, reading the same reading list, listening to the same professor, was a woman, and there were very few women then in economics, but that woman's name, Janet Yellen, I know what she knows because she and I were taught literally by the same professors in the same room at the same time. Yet what come out of her mouth, I know, is different from what she understands, unless the intervening years have erased from her mind vast material, but I don't believe that's happened. She's a perfectly nice person, nothing to do with any of that. She just doesn't know about this whole... No one at Yale ever taught her, and she did not have whatever it takes to go find it out on her own. And so she lives in a bubble, imagining that everybody else is in a bubble. It's remarkable. Well, if you'll permit me a few responses. One... I'm already loving talking to you, which is great. Two, I agree with you entirely about the exclusion of Marxism being idiotic, even if you don't agree with it, because you need to understand what other people are thinking. Three, what's striking then is that on your reading, it's an historical accident that Marxism was so out of favor in economics departments. And it was just that accident was caused by international relations rather than legitimate economic considerations. And then Fourth, uh, to start off, since this is the first 
any bona fide economics episode I've had on the show. I don't think we can really begin to basically, especially since most of what we're going to discuss emerges from what you identify as very, very basic problems of capitalism. So setting aside for the moment some of its broader social consequences, let's get into some of those basic economic tenets and unresolved mounting problems that are the economic considerations that economists should have been considering when comparing capitalism with Marxism. Sure. So let's start at the very beginning with what is economics? Why not? Basically, it's the study of how communities of human beings, whether you work at the micro level of a village or at the level of a state or a nation or the whole world, really doesn't matter because it, the subject matter is the following. How do people in communities organize the production and distribution of goods and services? The food, clothing, shelter we need to survive has to be produced. It doesn't fall, you know, a pair of pants don't fall from the sky. And even food for a large community is no longer something you can pick off a bush or find in the forest. You have to produce it. You have to use human labor and natural resources, land, water, soil, and so on. You put the, together the means of production, Marx's language, but it's, it's common in other you know, frameworks as well. You use natural resources, means of production. You put them together with human labor, brain, and muscle, and you get outputs food, clothing, shelter, entertainment, transportation, medical care, whatever you want. And economics is the study of how you organize that production and then how you organize the distribution of what you have produced among the people in the community that is doing the production. That's it. That's what economics has always been about. For most of human history, economics was not recognized as a distinct object of study. It was rather understood as part of life and not separated out. So, for example, if you go back to philosophy, if you're a philosophy person, if you go back to Plato and Aristotle, you won't find them writing about economics. On the other hand, if you read Aristotle and Plato, they are talking about the production and distribution of goods and services all the time, but it wasn't separated out. It's like human beings have had conversations about their dreams for many, many centuries, but only, you know, with Freud do you begin to get a science of the dream and what it tells you about human cognition and all the rest. So, Economics only in, with capitalism emerges out of the general study of life to become a topic of its own. And the reason is linked with capitalism, because before that, you had systems where it was kind of transparent, you might say, to people that they were producing and distributing and consuming goods and services. It was such a regular part of life that it didn't get a lot of attention. You might say it was like drinking some water. Human beings need to drink water, and all around us, we and the people we're with are drinking water all the time because we feel thirsty and we slake our thirst by drinking. Okay, human beings make things, grow things, rear animals, make pots and pans, and so on. So, for example, in an ancient village, you had historically sedimented ways of doing it. The family that made the bread for everybody in the village would typically have the children continue to make the bread for the children of everybody else. And so it would, uh, the people who raised the animals, you had divisions of labor along uh, lines of age, along lines of gender, 
along lines of whatever other variables the community use to organize. You know, the women might do this kind of work, the men that kind of work, children this kind of work, elderly, and so on. Capitalism, or let me take other examples, master-slave. In, in the centuries of slavery around the world, you organized it in a kind of interesting way, which was immediately naturalized. Some people were masters, kind of small number, and a large number were slaves. And the slaves did the work. It kind of went with the definition of slave. And the masters took over everything because they had to own the output because they owned the inputs and they owned the worker because that's what slave means. And so the, the people in charge who owned everything organized the slaves to do the work. They would take part of the output of the slaves, give it back to the slaves so they could eat and be warm in the winter and clothe themselves etc., etc., to keep on functioning, and, and they took the rest for themselves. And then you had feudalism. I mean, I'm doing a lot of history in a short amount of time. And there again, you had lords and serfs. The lords a small number, the serfs a very large number. The serfs did the bulk of the work. They weren't owned by the lords. It wasn't slavery. That's why it has a different name. But it was similar in this naturalized notion, this is just the way the world is. And you had the beginnings of a questioning in the Middle Ages because there was a memory that it was once slavery and it isn't anymore. The beginning to get a sense of progress, of shifting, of changing. You can find it in St. Augustine. You can find it in Thomas Aquinas, if you look at the people who were reflective, they, of course, were Roman Catholic clerics because that's what was literate at that time. That's what kept records. That's what had the social position to reflect on life. It was the church. That's the way that society was organized. But that also seemed God's will, nature's will, whatever you want. Now comes capitalism, and capitalism is different in a way that creates the field of economics. What capitalism does is declare, and it's a long explanation of why, but you and you might want to go into that, but what capitalism does is break all of the other, all of that historically sedimented natural arrangement, the village, the master-slave, the lord's serf, is all torn apart. That's why in, in the emergence of capitalism, the idea of individualism arises. We are each of us alone. We are each of us a unique individual. We each of us have our own individual relationship to God, a wholly new idea. We don't need the Catholic Church to intermediate between us and God, we can do it a la Luther or Calvin or any of the others on our own. This notion of the isolated individual means that anything, if you think like that, anything that happens collectively, a community, a family, any unity of more than one has to be a negotiated voluntary action of an isolated individual choosing, I'm using bourgeois language because they're the ones who developed this, choosing to get married, choosing to have a child, choosing to collaborate with another person to build a house or whatever. It's this notion that we are all atomistic unique individuals. And if, the minute you think like that, of course, you then have the problem, how do you account for collective reality? How do you account for a village? How do you account for a family? Why are these people cleaving together 
in some way? And the answer becomes, there is an advantage. I get something by linking up with other people. They get something by linking up with me. And therefore, we agree to be together in some way because of a mutual give and take. Well, you don't have to be a genius to understand where such an idea comes from. It comes from an institution that is very old, but is really brought to the fore in capitalism. And that institution is the market. The market is a place where I go as an individual I look for other individuals with whom I can make a deal. I'm going to give you six of my tomatoes if you give me four of your eggs. You value tomatoes more than eggs, so it's in your interest. I value eggs more than tomatoes, so it's in mine. If I can find a person like that, I can make a deal, and here we go, both of us are better off for entering and exchanging in the market than if we could not do it. Out of this observation of the market, by the way, markets existed in ancient villages, markets existed in ancient Greece. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but Aristotle and Plato had long debates about markets. By the way, both of them hated markets. Both of them denounced markets. You don't need to be a Marxist to be critical of markets. You have uh, Plato and Aristotle. The only disagreement, they, they both hated them. They disagreed. Plato thought, therefore, you shouldn't allow them. Aristotle thought it would be so disruptive to get rid of them that it would be less disruptive if you simply regulated them from above so that you would get the benefits and prevent the bad parts of them happening. The notion that you need the government to regulate markets is as old as Plato and Aristotle. You don't need the Soviet Union. You don't need China. But as an illustration to you of the ignorance I spoke to you about before, 99% of economists in this country have no idea that Plato and Aristotle were critical of markets. They simply do. They think Russia invented the suppression of markets. You know, I mean, it's so childish. It's so odd, especially in individuals who are very scholarly in the, in the best way, in their own little areas of expertise. But when they are citizens of a society where these issues are urgent, they have a level of ignorance which they have no incentive to overcome. Three marks. All right, let me finish then your, the, the story. In the market, you don't just have the, my example of a person who comes with tomatoes looking for a person with eggs and vice versa. That's the early market. That's the market in which the producer is also a consumer. I want those eggs, so I produce tomatoes and exchange them because that's the best way for me to get an egg, because I don't have any chickens, very hard to grow eggs in a, out of the field, right? That's hard. But markets always attract, um, like garbage attracts flies. Markets attract people who are not there to sell anything, and they're not there to buy anything. They are people who are not interested in producing anything, and they're not interested in consuming anything. Why are they in the market then? They're in the market to buy something and then to resell that same thing at a higher price. Because in the difference between the purchase price and the sales price, they make their living. These people are called merchants, in the old days, they are called Walmart today. They are people who don't produce anything, and they never have. 
They buy and resell. That's their job. Okay. And what is of interest to them, and the only thing that is of interest to them, is the difference in the price. Or to use the simple language, the profit. The gain they can achieve by cleverly buying things at a low price and then knowing how, where, and when to resell them at a higher price, keeping the difference, the profit, for themselves. This has existed from time immemorial, but about 400 years ago, starting in England, it becomes a new idea in the following sense. It's no longer just merchants, those who buy and resell, but there are people who are smart enough to see another opportunity. I might be able to buy inputs to production, raw material, tools, equipment, and I might be able to buy the labor time and effort of people. And I might be able to do that at a price that is less, when you add it all up, than what I can sell the output for. They discovered, can you do that? Yes, you can. In England in the 17th century, this was done on a mass scale for the first time, at least for the first time that we know much about. And it then took off. And it, me it has meant that ever since, we have had a very interesting reality, which as a philosopher, I think you could easily understand. Between the producer who makes things and the consumer who lives by consuming those things, capitalism in such an intermediary the producers do not themselves get together to produce and deliver stuff to the consumer. What the producers do in capitalism is they wait for someone to come and hire them. You know, when you get your PhD, you will then be shown the mechanism in our society where you will do what I had to do when I got my PhD. I went for two to three years to the annual meetings of the American Economic Association, usually held in New York or San Francisco or Chicago. And there I was, a young man among many, looking for a job among many. And there was a big bulletin board and you would put up, I am a young person, I just graduated from Yale, I want a job teaching economic development or public finance, or money and banking, or whatever the subfield was that I specialized in, and I was hoping to get an interview. There was a mechanism to connect us, and I, I got them, and I was be told, please be at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning in room 406 of the, you know, the hotel where the conference was held. And I would go the next morning and I would knock on the door at 10 o'clock, dressed in my suit, hoping like hell to impress. And then, because you know, I have a literary imagination, I began to realize that there's something very bizarre about this. I'm walking down the hallway of a hotel. I'm knocking on the door of a room, not my own. I'm hoping to be invited in by people who will then, because it's a hotel room, sit me on a bed. And I will then try to have them buy me. I, in that moment, I had an insight. Being an academic is a kind of prostitution in more ways than one. But back to my basic story. The capitalist is a person engaged in making profit. That's what he's there for. That's what people like me train young men and women in business schools to go out and do. You get an MBA, a Master of Business Administration, you learn how to make this decisions that maximize the profit of your enterprise. 
And that profit is, as always, the difference between the money you lay out to do your thing and the money you get at the end when you sell whatever was produced. Okay? Now here's Marx's criticism. It is unnecessary and irrational to insert that, ta that asshole into this situation. The workers don't need the boss, the capitalist, and the consumers don't either. Especially when you remember that the producers and the consumers are the same people on different sides of the relationship. And that the workers could, of course, get together as a group and produce and deliver the output to the consumers who could consume it individually or in a group. There is no need. And Marx's whole effort was to demonstrate, teach his generation, and we who follow continue the effort to teach people. And here's the metaphor I'll use. Once upon a time, human beings thought that the only way to live in any community, any society, is if somebody was the king. And if that person's son would be the next king, or his wife or his niece would become the queen. And that if we didn't have a king to intercede with God or to run the society, we subjects, our civilization would dissolve. Then came a day when we separated the heads of the kings from the rest of their bodies with guillotines. They were gone, and civilization, imagine it, survived. We don't need the kings. We got rid of the kings, except they fooled us. They changed their name and crept back into our lives, and their name is CEO. The guy who runs the company has the power of a king. Literally, life and death. You're fired. I take away your money. You, your husband, your wife, your children, the community that depends. Fuck you all. I don't have to do it. I'm gone. You know where I'm going? To China, because the wages are cheaper. That's the history of this country in the last 40 years. Completely hollowed out to a country that brought the manufacturing and is now the greatest competitor the United States has ever seen and is losing, the United States is losing the competition to the Chinese. It's already lost. We are an empire going down and we can't face it. We live in a world of denial because it's too difficult and we never got the analysis that would allow us to understand village economics rose and fell, slave economic system rose and fell, feudalism rose and fell. Guess what is going to happen to capitalism? We know it rose. We know it evolved over time. You know what's next? Falling. And you know when? It's already underway. You can't in the United States, you can't find 10 people who economists who could talk like that. And it's not because they aren't smart. They are. It's not because they aren't well-trained. They are. It's not because they're not nice, intelligent people. I know many of them. They are all those things. But they have willingly foregone an education in a critical framework. You know, Marx was not an economist. Marx was a philosopher. He got his Ph.D. when he wrote a dissertation on ancient Greek philosophy, Epictetus. His great teacher, Hegel. His position, he was in that line, Hegel, Fichte, Schelling, you know, uh, uh, Kant, Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel, and Marx is their student. He went to study economics because he figured out and taught me that it's the area that the philosophers can't 
They can't get it. There's something, he didn't know what, and I don't either, that blocks, thwarts, keeps it. You know, it's like the students that I encounter who can't do mathematics. You know, because something happened early in their lives that made mathematics scary or weird or hard, you know. I don't know what that is. I'm not sure anyone has ever really figured that out. But, you know, I did mathematics before I did. I loved mathematics. I loved philosophy. The only reason I went into economics was my parents made jokes. Who's going to ever hire a philosopher? you got to get something practical. So I went and I studied economics and found my way to Marx. That's, that's something else. But for me, capitalism's problem is bold and clear. You have a contradiction between an economic system whose ostensible purpose is to coordinate the producers of goods and services with what's needed by the consumers. But you have inserted, historically, in between these two, the capitalist. And the capitalist objective is profit maximization. And the only way that is not irrational is if you draw an equation between profit maximization and the, we the well-being of the largest number. In other words, you do away with the contradiction by imagining it's not there. But of course it's there. To imagine that there is no question that there's a contradiction between profitability and what the society needs. I mean, look at the United States today. We have millions of people that are homeless or living in too many people in a room. Why? Because housing is a profit-making industry in our country. And what's profitable is not what people need to live in. That's a problem. No, we cannot have that. We have to assert, by the way, that, that's what they told me to teach all my life. I taught at the University of Massachusetts. I teach now at the New School University here in New York City. I taught at Yale, blah, 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 all of it. They teach us to teach young people that the maximization of profit by a capitalist is a magical way to organize a society for the greatest good, for the greatest number. In other words, there is no contradiction between profit maximizing and the welfare of people. So we know we have private enterprises. We know they are maximizing profit because that's what they tell us and that's what we observe. And we have homeless people and hungry people and, you know, distress across the country, uh, literally a country falling apart. We can't do shit about the climate. I mean, nothing. It, it, it's a pathetic display. And it goes back to your first question. Why would we be a society that systematically prevents um, a Marxist critical approach from having an opportunity to teach. And I'll use myself as an example, right? The only reason I'm telling you this. I graduated from Harvard, magna cum laude, but there's only about a dozen or 20 people each year to do that. I was a great student, no problem. Then I went to Stanford, I wrote my master's thesis. Then I went to Yale, I got another master's in economics, another master's in history, and a PhD in economics. I got more degrees that you know than, than a dog has fleas. And yet a person like me will not get a job in most cases. And the reason I got one was because I had that pedigree. The truth of it is, you know, without going into the details, I've had a tenure track job all my adult life. I'm I'm lucky. You know, I have a nice pension. I'm I'm in I'm in fine shape, but it's not because of what I know. I published a dozen books, I don't, I don't know, more articles than I could count. I like to write, so I have no, I don't have a psychological block to do it. But you're not going to find me or anyone like me at a major university in this country in the economics department. Their debates are between 
if you know a little bit about it, neoclassical economics and Keynesian economics. This kind of debate they can have. This is the equivalent of, do you like hamburgers more than hot dogs? Or hot dog, you know, okay, I mean, I, I'm perfectly happy to enter that debate, but I wouldn't put it high up on the list of important topics to work out. Like capitalism, communism, that'd be a big one. I would be, but you don't have that one. You know, when I was a graduate student, just beginning, most economics department curricula had a course called Economic Crisis or alternative title Business Cycles. But whatever the title was, here's the topic. And they would say in the, in the little blurb for the course, something like this. Our capitalist system, notice the our, our capitalist system has a history of, you know, looks like a an up and down wave, like a sine curve in mathematics. You know, it, it looks like this because it's cyclical. Every four to seven years, it crashes. Some crashes are severe. Some are shallow. Some last a long time. Some last a few months. It varies. But this pattern, it says all this capitalism. And therefore, we need to have a course that examines why did this happen and what has been done by human communities in the United States, in other parts of the world. How have they tried to cope with this? Because it's a fundamental instability of the system have they figured out how to prevent it? Well, you know the answer. If you read today's Wall Street Journal, it's worried about whether the next crash is going to hit in the second half of 2023 or only in 2024. Eliminate them, we haven't done. We've tried for 300 years, we haven't made it. But if you look at the curriculum of American economics departments today, no such courses. Because we've overcome the problem? No. Because it's unbearable to confront that we have a system that is so unstable, I'll give you a joke that I make when I teach large lecture courses. It goes like this. If you lived with a roommate as unstable as capitalism, you would have moved out long ago. And the students all laugh, even the freshmen. Because they don't understand the economics, but they know what I'm talking about. Because their Uncle Harry lost his job eight years ago and used to tell stories at the family picnic about the upset of his life at that occasion. And they kind of, they got it. But we have a system, you know, I'm married to a psychotherapist. So you'll pardon me, you'll, you'll see sprinkled through my language all that she has taught me. But one of the great concepts I learned from her was the concept of denial. You're asking me questions is consistent. This is not a critique of you in any sense, but you're asking me questions consistent with my experience, which, which perhaps you can appreciate through me, the odd experience I have. And by the way, I was born in Ohio. I'm as American as apple pie. But my experience is I live in a country that's in a state of denial for which urgent therapy is the recipe. And I, I, I say it. I now produce a weekly radio and television show. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's called Economic Update. I have 350,000 YouTube uh, followers, right? Uh, Free Speech TV Network sends the program out once a week for half an hour to about 55 million homes. My audience is enormous. I don't hide the Marxism. I don't hide the critique of capitalism. Any argument that these ideas are either too complicated for people, or too left-wing, or too scary. I mean, I have all the empirical proof you could ask for that that's not true. Otherwise, I wouldn't have these numbers. I mean, 
I didn't have the I, I don't have money. I'm not wealthy. I, I can't buy my audience. I'm not a corporation. My audience was built up because people find it interesting. I'll tell you a cute story you might like. Well, I was at Harvard. I started out taking courses in math, chemistry, and biology. I wanted to be a scientist because that's what my parents wanted for me. After a year, I couldn't stand it. We had a great family crisis. I'm the eldest child in my family. And I left and I wanted to study philosophy until my parents said, okay, you can leave science, but you can't go to philosophy because nobody will ever hire you. You're going to go for a job and say, hello, I'm a philosopher. They'll laugh you out of the room. So I did. I did my economics. And I also studied history because I found it wonderfully taught me everything I wanted to learn. And I also, long story short, I hooked up with a Marxist scholar who lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, three blocks from my dormitory, but he wasn't part of the academic community at Harvard. Um, he had been a Euro he was a refugee like my parents, and he'd been an academic uh, in Germany and in Spain. And anyway, he said to me, "I'd like to teach you Marxism if you're interested." Absolutely. And for two or three years, at least, I would go to his house every week or two um, for dinner, and he and his wife would make me a look. That would have been enough compared to the dorm food. This was wonderful. But the best part was after dinner, he would take me into his study and he took me through the classics of Marxism. Das Kapital. And we did it sometimes in English, sometimes in German. Because my mother was born in Berlin. My first language is German. And I, I speak German. My father was French. I speak French. I only learned English when they put me in a kindergarten here in the United States. I was born in Ohio. I had to learn English because that's what they were doing there. So every time I had a paper to write in a history course or a political science course or an economics course, I would go to this gentleman and he would say, well, if you're interested in the Marxist approach to this, here's the books you should get. Here's the articles you should read. So I would run to Widener Library, that's the huge library of the Harvard uh, system, and they had every book in any way, it's one of the best libraries in the world. So I could get everything in English or any other language. I had a four-year tutorial in Marxism. Every term paper I wrote was a crude mechanical application of Marxism as filtered through the mind of a 19 or 20 year old young man. They weren't very good. I, I've kept them so I can tell you. Honestly, they were not very good. But my professors thought they were fascinating. You know why? Because they didn't have a clue what Marxism was. This was their first introduction to some Marxist idea. So they couldn't evaluate it it's crude, it's mechanical, it, it's no service to Marx, he missed half of what's going on here. They couldn't make those judgments. They thought it was an interesting idea, which it was. They'd never seen it before, which is about them. And so I got A's. I'm magna cum laude, thanks to Karl Marx and the ignorance of Marx of my professors at Harvard. It's a shame, but that's the truth. And it tells you, should tell you a lot about American academic education and the reason why more and more Americans now, more than ever in my lifetime, are critical of, more, of capitalism. They just have no idea what to do with their antipathy. They don't know what to, where to go. They have no idea. If you say something to them about the Soviet Union or China, they think of a horrible dictatorship. That's not a place to go. So they don't like the capitalism they know. They don't want to know anything about the alternatives. And so they're stuck. 
and you get a depressed society, a society of particularly young people who can see, who are critical, but don't know what to do or where to go with it. Very sad. Very, very sad. Well, I'm going to be undisciplined again and make a, a make a bunch of comments and you can bite at will or wait until I get to the more logical follow-up about capitalism's fundamentals. But speaking of kings and guillotines, I loved your analogy of the king from The Sickness is the System, that the king has his power because the people believe he is the king, but people only believe he is the king because the he has the power they endow him with. And it's a vicious circle in the same, same sense as with capitalism. And then another thing I was thinking is, you mentioned Freud and dreams earlier, and your wife, who is a psychotherapist, and Marxists and Freudians have long been friends, I think. And that makes me wonder just whether you sympathize with Freud more than, more than contemporary psychologists do in the same way that you sympathize with Marx more than contemporary economists do. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll skip what I was going to say about Aristotle and Plato, even though that's very interesting too. But I, the main problem of capitalism, as I hear it from you, is that is the middle, the middleman, the the capitalist who stands between producer and consumer. But I'd like to make sure that we can identify and explicitly flesh out the, I guess, secondary major problems you see in capitalism. So we can see if I've identified them correctly. And the first, I think, is that, again, according to you, so tell me if I'm wrong, Capitalism organizes uh, businesses, factories, etc., in an undemocratic way so that the middleman has control rather than the producer or the consumer. Then, you and you indicated this, capitalism is inherently unstable in the sense that we have these massive crashes. I think, the, I think you said every four to seven years. And uh, that certainly coheres with my... Uh, loose following of the news. And then the third thing is that capitalism perpetuates and worsens inequalities of income, of wealth, of social standing, of access to resources in general. Am I right here that those are the, the main economic problems with capitalism as you see it? Yes, I would. I would. Yes. The short answer is yes. I would only qualify it slightly by saying those are the macro problems. In other words, if you look at the economy as a whole, it is unstable. By the way, the number four to seven years, there's an agency uh, here in the United States called the National Bureau of Economic Research, NBER. You can Google it. You'll learn all about it. They keep track of the instability. So I rely on their historic... They are not leftist, Marxist, or anything like that. Um, none of the basic sources of my data come out of people like me. I, I have to rely on people governed by very different uh, priorities. Anyway, the NBER has that number. Every four to seven years is the average business cycle from peak to peak or trough to trough. That's the way the history has worn out. So on the macro level, gross inequality, and I mean gross, I, I don't know if you're familiar with these numbers. Uh, the billionaires of our, of our world, there's only a few thousand billionaires in the world. But if you add them all together, they own together more than the bottom half of the of the planet, which is now in the neighborhood three and a half billion people. So 2,000 together have more wealth than three and a half billion. I mean, you have to go back to ancient Egypt, pharaohs, pyramids, to get anything like this level of inequality. Yet the interval from the py pyramids in Egypt to today has been an interval constantly affected by people, uh, religious leaders, political leaders, 
who have screamed and argued for equality. You know, like Washington and Jefferson, you know, all men are created equal. Bullshit. Right? They're not. That was a desire. That was a hope. That was a goal. That was a utopian image, whatever you want to call it. People have wanted, in large numbers, an equality that they've never been able to institute. So it keeps being a goal. But the reality, no. And capitalism is in many ways the worst because it went further. And look, the slogans of the French Revolution, which was the end of feudalism in France, 1789, the slogans were liberté, égalité, fraternité. In English, liberty, equality, brotherhood. Okay. The United States Revolution around the same time, democracy. We don't have any of those things. Those are wild hopes, but they're not realized. If I, I was once asked, what is Marx's task in his writing? Here's my answer. Marx loved the capitalist revolution. He, what, he, he loved the French Revolution, and he deeply admired, we know that from his writings and his letters, the American Revolution. Liberty, equality, fraternity, democracy. I love that. But he comes 50 years after that. And he looks around and he says, they promised that the overthrow of feudalism, we would get capitalism plus liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy. We got the capitalism. We didn't get those other things. So my task, Marx says to himself and his audience, is to explain to the world and myself. What happened? Why did capitalism betray the promises its leaders made that by getting rid of the Lord and the serf, by throwing out the old church that governed the feudalism of Europe, we would have these great things? You know, he loved the, the symphonies of Beethoven. Beethoven's symphonies are the celebration of liberty, equality, fraternity, and the army of Napoleon liberating all of Europe from feudalism. Marx's task, and ours, mine, the people who come next, what the hell went wrong? And Marx's answer, which is our answer too, what capitalism could never face, that the obstacle for capitalism in bringing us what it promised the liberty, equality, fraternity, democracy in the Declaration of Independence or the Declaration of Human Rights is capitalism itself. Of course it can't see that. that that's the psychology. You know, you can, you can see the flaw in the next person, but it's you. It's, you can't see it in you. About Freud, absolutely. But what is important about Freud for us is are two things above all, and one much more important than the other. The less important, very important, but not the most important, is the recognition that there's a universe called the unconscious, an incredible part of the human being, of the human experience, that when you see something or think something, you do it on two registers, one you're aware of, the other one you're not. But it functions, the two function alike. They respond to stimuli. They form an opinion. They form a reaction. One you can articulate because the society welcomes it. But the other one you can't because the society doesn't want it, starting with your mother and father upon whom you depend literally for your life. And there's this this separation. In German, the word, Freud was German, Spaltung in German, splitting. The brain splits at this early into the conscious and the, it un opens up an unbelievable. I love, for example, I don't know if you, if you follow things in the art world, but there's a magnificent school of painting early in the 20th century called surrealism. And one of the great Painters is a Belgian, 
named Rene Magritte. My favorite artist. My favorite too. And that's what he does. He asks the Freudian question and paints his answer. Spectacular. But here's the more important thing. For me, the most important writing of Freud is the first one, The Interpretation of Dreams, 1896. In that book is a chapter called The Dream Work. And Freud is trying to explain why the dream, you know, you wake up and you remember you were lying on the grass looking up through an apple tree and a worm fell on your nose, whatever it is. Why? What, what in the world? How do we explain that was your dream? As opposed to you were riding on a horse and a lovely young lady jumped on the horse with you or whatever other. What? What? And he, he uses a word. And the word in English, I, I only know, if I, funny, I don't remember the German. Um, in, I can figure it out, but... I, I, in English, overdetermination. As in mathematics, you know, if you have uh, more equations and you have variables, you, you have a problem. Work this out. Well, it has a completely different meaning in psychology. But he talks about how all the environment, everything in the environment produces that dream. And the trick of the analyst is to explain why this element and that element show up in the dream whereas these other elements are pushed aside or play a secondary role. The French pick it up, and it becomes in French sur-détermination, over-determination, right? Sur, the French, over. Well, why is that interesting? Because three of the greatest Marxist theorists since Marx, the Hungarian Georg Lukács, I don't know if these names mean anything to you, the French communist uh, Louis Althusser, also a philosophy professor, and Sartre, a French icon, right? So Sartre, Althusser, Lukács, there are others, Gramsci in Italy also. They pick up this idea over determination. And if you ever have an opportunity, and if you're interested, I'll be glad to tell you, you take a look at my work and the work of the people I work with, it's all about overdetermination is what Marxism in the 21st century will be founded on. It'll be different from the Marxism of the 20th century. Americans are not aware that Marxisms have to have dates attached to them because for them it's all one indistinguishable mass. But that's our ignorance again. If you go to Europe, they don't know exactly when I go to European conferences and I talk about the difference between this Marxism and that, they all they know because it's part of their universe. Here in the United States, I, I have to explain everything to people who don't want to learn it. So it's a different story. But the psychology is there. The critique of capitalism on the macro level is about the instability and the inequality. But on the micro level, let me hammer home because that's where Marxism is going in your lifetime, more than in mine. At the micro level, the critique is grotesque, grotesque injustice and anti-democratic organization, which are not only bad in themselves, I'll explain that in a moment, but are also cause of, uh, causative of the instability and the inequality at the macro level. What do I mean? The organization of production, the way your typical factory, office, or store are organized. There's a tiny group of people at the top, the owner of the business, the, 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 the director of the business. If it's a corporate structure, the board of directors, I don't know if you're familiar with this, most, most business in America is done by corporations corporation is set up, there's owners, those are people who own shares, and they annually elect a board of directors, typically between 10 and 20 people. They are the capital. They are the ones who hire and fire, 
They are the ones who receive the profits of the enterprise and decide how it's used. They are elected to the position of board by the shareholders. Since 10% of American shareholders own 80% of the shares, it's the richest 10% of the country that control the business system. All right? The vast majority of people are employees. The board of directors, 10 or 20, I mean, General Motors has 150, whatever it is, thousand workers. The board of directors has 15 people. Okay, so as grotesque as you want, the top, the board of directors or the owner of it's a little business has the power to hire and fire you, to deprive you of your income, to deprive your family of its income, to deprive the local community of its survivability whenever he wants. Some people imagine that there are trade unions. The, the dominant sector of the American economy is private, privately owned enterprises. Among private employees, labor unions today, as I'm speaking to you, represent 6.5% of them. The other 93.5% have no union. You may read about unions, but you're reading about the 6%. There's a big effort in this country now to organize unions at places like Amazon, Starbucks, and all. But that's a response of an of a eviscerated working class having to reconstruct a labor movement because it was destroyed as part of that Cold War. So at the local level, you have a dictatorship inside every business, which the working class will tell you about. I am in awe of my manager. If I don't please my manager, I'm toast. I'm gone. Of course I work like an asshole. Of course I come to work early. I'm trying to be secure in a job that has no security. I am terrorized in this workplace. That's the reality. We live the the notion that we have a democracy is so ridiculous that it's hard for people like me to keep a, you know, a straight face, a pleasant manner. I don't want to take it out on whoever I happen to be talking to. But when the United States says it's going around the world bringing democracy, I mean, it, it's so fraudulent, you don't know where to start. We've never had a democracy in workplaces. We have democracy in the community where we live. We vote for the mayor. We don't vote for the CEO. Workers never vote. They have no vote. Not by law, not by custom, not at all. So there's not even the pretense. There is no democracy. And where is it absent? The workplace. And where do most adults spend most of their life? At the workplace. That's the best hours of every day. You get up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you go to work, and there you pour out your brains and your muscle to be productive and creative. And then on the way home, you stop at a bar to have a happy hour to underscore how unhappy all the other ones were. We know we live in a dictatorship, but we mouth horse shit about democracy because it makes us feel better. The way a bus driver really appreciates if you refer to him or her as a transportation engineer they might like more money, but they'll take a better title. So, I mean, the, that lack of democracy in the workplace is the training ground for accepting the fakery of even the political democracy. So we all know that the rich people buy the politicians. We know how they do it with donations, with lobbyists. We know it. Everybody knows. There's a wonderful song by the Canadian um, Cohen, I forget his first name. Is that in? Forgot his first name. He's dead. He died a few years ago. But it, one of his most famous songs is a song titled Everybody Knows. And he goes through it what we all know and what we pretend. 
the insight I owe my wife. One of the things she specializes in is a, as a therapist is people who, as children, suffered um, incestuous sexual abuse. So when she first started, this was something she thought was an important but rare occurrence in our culture. <laughs> she then discovered it's everywhere. But there's been a, I mean, everywhere. Rich people, poor people, people in the middle, white people, black people, you name it. Catholic clergy, loads of them. Other clergy, uh, everywhere, everywhere. But it is important to remember, and this is Freud, that the first thing you ought to think of when something is labeled a taboo is that the, is a damn good chance that the articulation of something qua taboo is a method of coping with a reality. It's rare. It, you know, it happens in the backwoods of Maine. It's, it's, it, you know, no, it isn't. But it is so difficult to cope with that the culture, including the victims of it, don't know. If my wife were here, she would tell you of all the clients she's had over the years who she had to work with some of them for years before it came back to them what happened when they were six or nine in the church or in the basement or in the living room or when Uncle Harry was babysitting them, etc., etc. And I remember thinking, as has happened so often, that trying to understand the complexity of a person or a family is, of course, not that different from trying to understand the economics of a city, of a country, of an epoch. It's complicated, it's multidimensional, and that overdetermination is a very good way to get it. Stop looking for the key cause of anything because it isn't there. Everything has immense causes. You can never get to all of them because there are too many. They're that eight on its side on your shirt there. It's the infinity symbol that over-determines everything. So, what you know what that does? It makes every explanation partial. It makes every explanation insufficient. It makes every explanation provisional. And you know what that guards against? Absolute truth. Nobody has that. In order to know absolutely, you have to know all the over-determinants. But they are infinite. And if the concept of infinite has any meaning, it's precisely that it's not finite. That's what the word means. And now you're stuck. If the determinants are not finite, your rendition of them isn't finished either. And it means nobody can be Hitler. Nobody can be Stalin. Nobody's in a position to, or the Pope or Joe Biden or anybody else. I don't know if this is all too much or too dispersed, but it's what a Marxist economist in the United States in our time has to say. As you just characterized it, capitalism is an economic system structured around a, a fundamental inequality between employer, of which there are few on the one hand, and employees on the other. And in addition to the, the macro issues we've discussed, there are also very serious social consequences to uh, this relationship, and some of which we've hinted at, but we haven't gotten into any specifics. And I'm wondering what you see as the major ones we're dealing with today. And before you respond, though, the extended metaphor that you use of viewing these problems as symptoms of the underlying illness that is the economic system is quite powerful. And I also 
uh, just based on what you just said, I, I kind of look at this underlying illness, the, the system as what is unconscious. Yeah, uh, l- let me jump in with one important caveat. I don't focus on the economics because I think it's more important than anything else. I don't. Let me be as as sharp as I know how. I think the, the, the problems of our society are shaped in part by our diets, by the climate, by the music we have, by the forms of sexuality. By, I'm trying to think of, of everything. I don't focus on economics out of some notion, which most of my professional colleagues need to believe. I don't. That economics is foundational. That economics is the key. To, I don't believe that. I focus on economics because others don't, not because it's more important. If it got the attention that other factors get, including psychological factors, I wouldn't be an economist. I would have gone off and done something else. I believe that's true for Marx as well. He began as a philosopher. I began as a, as a natural scientist, and then went to philosophy, and then went to economics. I wouldn't have made that travel. I wouldn't have gone that direction were it not for the fact that there is a kind of, if you allow me to, get, to play the game, there's a return of the repressed. Marxism is the return of class analysis, of this division of the society in the economy between those who run the show and snatch the bulk of the product and those who do the work and are asked to live in the worst conditions under the greatest insecurity, etc. This injustice, this grotesquerie is denied, hidden, downplayed, marginalized. That's why I'm an economist. I want to, I, I mean, I'm like the, the fellow who has a puppy and the puppy just did something on the rug, and I know, and even the puppy knows, and should not have done that on the rug. And so we take the puppy and put their nose very close to what they just did in order to hopefully teach the lesson, hey, don't do that on the rug. Right? I'm here to say, stop imagining, well, let me be sharper with you either. Millions of Americans have been badly screwed over the last 40 years as capitalists did the following thing because it was profitable. They automated a huge number of jobs. They replaced work done by human beings with a computer, then with a robot, and now with artificial intelligence. At the same time, they moved jobs out of the United States to China, India, Brazil, and all over the place. And finally, they brought it for the jobs they couldn't send to where the people are low wage. They brought the low wage people here, the immigrants. So Americans are torn apart. They're angry at China and they're angry at the immigrants. And they they abuse the immigrants at the border in Texas and Louisiana at all. And I'm standing there and I'm going, of course, you're angry. You lost your job. You lost your income. You were told to be a real man. You could have your wife at home and you could make money and she could be at home, but she can't. You know why? Because to get the money to have that American dream that the advertisers shoving down your throat every 15 minutes, you've got to send the wife out. And when she's out there, she realizes you're not the greatest thing since white bread. You're not so attractive altogether. Moreover, she doesn't need you. She has her own job and her own income. 80% of divorces in this country are initiated by women. Hello, why do you think that might be? But the economy is a problem? Oh, no. You pick up today's New York Times financial, the economy is strong. It isn't. But we live in a country of denial. So for me, I'm looking at a 
society, and I feel so bad. The, the working class is angry, rightfully. It's been badly treated, rightfully. Meanwhile, Elon Musk disposes of $150 billion. He can't spend it. If you spend a million dollars every minute, you still wouldn't run out. This is lunacy. What are we doing? We are ripping our society apart, focusing the anger where it doesn't belong, protecting the super rich who would be just as luxuriously living if they had one billion dollars as if he had 150 the rest of it should be going for what the society needs if he weren't such an asshole he'd do that himself but he's caught up in the same denial so we don't have it I'll give you a, a very concrete example we have three levels of government in the united states federal state and local all of them operate by raising taxes. If you're going to fund public universities, you've got to have taxes. If you're going to maintain roads, you got to have taxes. If you're going to have public schools, you got to raise taxes. I mean, yeah, every, every, everybody knows that. It exists everywhere in the world. Well, what do you tax? There are three things, basically, that every government taxes. Income, as you get it, you got to give the government some. Wealth, what you own, you know, you got to give the government some. And spending. When you spend, you got to give the government. So if you buy something uh, in a store, there's a sales tax that you pay that to the government. $20 for the shirt, $2 the government tax. Income withheld from your weekly check, your money goes to the government. Now we come to property. Is there a tax on property in the United States? Yes, there is. We tax land, we tax buildings. And we tax what are called business inventories. The federal government doesn't do that, does not tax property. The state governments do not tax property. The only government that taxes property are local governments, cities and towns. In every city and town, there's something called the assessor office. The job of the assessor is to assess the value of the land buildings and then to tax them. So you pay 2% or 6% or whatever it is each year on the value of your property in that year. Okay? How do rich people, really rich people, hold property? They don't have property in land all that much. They don't have property in buildings all that much. Most of the property of really rich people are stocks and bonds. What is the property tax in the United States on toxin uh, stocks and bonds. And let me remind you that the richest 10% own 80% of the stocks and bonds. Answer, there is no property tax on stocks and bonds. Okay, I mean, if I were Perry Mason on television, I'd say to the judge, I rest my case. My, my other side has no case. I mean, uh, what wild craziness would make you tax the automobile that a worker has as property, but not the portfolio of stocks and bonds as his employer has. What in the... And look, I have colleagues who spend their lives making up bullshit to make it look reasonable that we don't tax that kind of property. But after two martinis with those people, because I know them, they know what they do is bullshit, and they feel bad about it, but it pays the bills. You live in a society, when you live in a society where the corruption runs that deep, that it has become naturalized, that it has become the air we breathe, the universe we live in, I would argue that one, not the only, not the most important, one foundation of an economic system we call capitalism is that peculiar organization of the enterprise, the factory, the office, the store, in which we take it as natural, as necessary, that there is a boss, that the decisions, the basic business decisions, what to produce, 
how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the revenue are made by those few people. We all work. Once a year at the Christmas party, we all get together, drink too much, and the boss gets up on a rickety table, thanks all of the employees for their hard work this last year, which are crucial to the great profit we make. And then he sends the employees home because they have absolutely nothing to say about the profit he just thanked them for producing. Wow. And all of this is taken as normal. If that's normal, then we have a society whose corruption means that the Marxist conclusion has so often been to get beyond this, you have to kind of start from scratch. You have to re... And there come the, then the ideas that the workplace ought to become a democratic community. One person, one vote. We decide together what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the revenue that we have all together produced. We don't need the boss. We don't need the capitalist. We never did. Let's get rid of him. Let's see, can't we do better? The same impulse to do better than slavery helped defeat it. The impulse to do better than feudalism helped to defeat it. All that socialism and Marxism really are is the desire and the feeling we can do better than capitalism. And that's what will bring, bring the system to an end. It won't be a war, bad as that is. It'll be the intolerability of continuing in this way. Well, Richard, we got to about a tenth of what I wanted to cover. We missed COVID, uh, mit bestimming, unemployment, some pushback in defense of capitalism, which I might have gotten to eventually, but you're an impressively captivating speaker, and I really hope we can continue this soon. But for the time being, thanks so much for doing this with me. I totally enjoyed it. My pleasure. <laughs>